Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Business Law. Um, today we're going to be talking once again about contracts. Um, but this time, what we will be talking about is in in um, in comparison to contracts, um, the aspects of capacity, illegality, and third party rights. So um, there's going to be four different sections, um, obviously entailing those capacity, illegality, third party rights, and then also we'll talk about the key takeaways. And well, let's just jump right into it. Um, so capacity. Uh, so we'll start off with quote. In this section, we will learn when the lack of capacity, or excuse me, we will learn when the lack of capacity due to infancy, mental cognition, or intoxication may invalidate or otherwise uh, and otherwise binding contract. Capacity is defined as the maximum amount that something can contain. However, the legal definition of capacity refers to the ability to make a rational decision based upon all relevant facts and considerations. Um, and so here are some factors when capacity is called into question. So minors. Minors are anyone under the age of 18 um, they're often referred to as infants in the law, which is interesting. Um, like well, in, sorry. Can yeah, I what? Jump in? Yeah. In like formal settings? In formal just, settings, yeah. They're technically referred to as infants. Like they would just to be the like, textbook. you're an infant. Yes. Interesting, right? Okay. Um, although 18 year olds are legal adults, many institutions and people, such as landlords or banks, are wary of entering into contracts with them despite having full capacity to contract. Um, this is because they're considered high risk. If a minor or infant entered into a contract, it is voidable, but not void. Meaning someone's under 18, that doesn't make the contract instantly void, but it means that it is subject to being void. Um, let's see. There are a few exceptions for the rule the first being that minors are liable for the costs of fair, of fair necessities um, or the value of the necessities defined as food, medicine, clothing, or shelter. And this is the reason why landlords might be weary about entering into contracts with 18-year-olds or 17-year-olds who are starting college. Um, a second in exception involves ratification, which occurs when a minor entered into a contract and continues or ratifies the contract by following the terms after their 18th birthday. An example in the book was, quote, if Jane purchased a car last year and then turned 18 last month, should she make another monthly payment, she would be ratifying the contract and now is bound by the terms, end quote. A third exception comes from a min if a minor lies to an adult and says they're an adult themselves, the minor will be held to the contract. They may also be held for damages. Let's go ahead and move on to mental illness. Um, mental illness is another aspect of capacity that can make a contract voidable. It is vital to understand whether or not mental illness would actually impair the individual's choices. Bipolar disorder is an example of mental illness that can impair judgment. If a person is found mentally ill in court, the contract is not instantly void, but voidable. A judge, or the judge appoints a guardian for the mentally ill plaintiff and will grant them the ability to void the contract if they find it necessary. Next, let's talk about intoxication. Um, you remember there's an episode of Suits that we watched a couple months ago where the guy gets drunk and yes. gambles away his, his yeah. place. So that's where we're involved in now. So intoxication by legal standards refers to individuals suffering from the effects of legal or, uh, or illegal drugs or alcohol. If a person enters into a contract um, while suffering from the effects of these substances to the point where their judgment is, is impaired, the contract is void and conditions must be set back to the original place. And from that episode, he, Harvey was defending the man who made that contract when he was intoxicated and they went back in the um, the cameras and counted how many drinks he had. Exactly. Interesting, So that's, right? is that an example of that word? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that, that needs to be taken into capacity because, you know, we talked about um, 
the judgment has to be impaired. Mm-hmm. So, whether or not that guy's judgment was impaired was up to debate, right? Okay, yeah. Um, so, let's move on to um, illegality. A contract must be within the parameters of the law. The textbook gives an awesome example. If Bill um, agrees to sell an uh, illicit drug to Ted and then backs out of the deal, deal after looking at a CTR ring, you'll see the absurdity of Ted taking Bill to court to enforce this contract. The effect of this rule is that the illegal agreement is void and the courts will not enforce the contract, even if the wrongdoer benefited from the party's detriment. An exception to this is ignorance. If a woman does not know that a man is married and marries him, she could sue and void the contract. Because, hmm. you know, bigamy is currently illegal. Um, some agreements may seem legal, but are in fact illegal. An example given is a non-complete contract that states that if someone could not have a job in the same industry is legal in some states and illegal in others, or like a, like a non-compete. Mm, yes. That's illegal in certain places, but legal in others, so you need to take it's that into account. It's legal in New York. And illegal in California. After a certain amount of time, I believe. Um, let's talk about third-party rights. So, um, <laughs> third-party rights are not associated with the initial contract, but who, um, or third parties are not associated with the initial contract, but may acquire a third party rights. A third party may be the assignee. If you bought a couch on behalf of someone, they are the assignee because they assign you to get the couch. Mm. You are given the rights to receive the benefits of the couch and are the, um, and uh, let's see, they are the assigner because they gave away the benefits. Yeah. An assignee quote, this is a quote by the way, an assignee acquires the rights to receive the benefit of the contract. The signer may assign any right unless it would materially change the obligation of the obligator, increase the risk involved, or diminish the value of the contract, or is forbidden by the law. Or the contract states that it's not allowed. End quote. To authorize an assignee and a signer, um, it must be made known beforehand. An example that I have seen in my day-to-day life is if a student ordering a transcript from the school um, in order for someone else to pick it up on their behalf, they would have to state beforehand that that's what their plan was. Um, the school cannot honor that contract unless it was stated specifically before that contract was entered into. So I've seen that situation in real life. Um, now let's go ahead and get into the delegation of duties. Um, just as one can assign rights, Duties can also be delegated. Duties are the part of the contract where the service must be rendered. I have a duty to sell you the couch. You have the duty to give me $100. A delegatee could be a person assigned to give you that right. If I was hired to paint a fence, I could delegate that duty to my friend. Um, this quote, this is a good time to remind you that words matter here. You delegate a duty and you assign a right. Mm. Saying that you delegate a right makes as much sense as Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> Which I thought was an interesting quote. So. Is he talking about that? He is that quote talking about the movie or? Yeah, I guess he's he's I saying that it doesn't Napoleon make sense, right? Bono- okay, never mind. Never mind. Yeah, true. That too. Um, now let's go ahead and jump into the takeaways. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there were many aspects of this chapter that I found interesting. I enjoyed hearing about the contracts that are voidable in certain scenarios through capacity. Um, it cleared up a lot of misconceptions that come through the media as well. Mm-hmm. And mental illness, minors, and contracts deemed illegal are the foundations of voiding a contract, not instantly making it void. Mm. So I thought that was cool because, you know, you can't just get out of the contract, but you can have the ability to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the information on third parties makes a lot of sense as well. Certain contracts allow for the assignments of rights and delegations of duties. I liked having a personal connection with the material this time um, from working in the records and registration office at the school. Um, The situation actually did happen. Um, Not to get into too many details, but um, that was something that we had to to try to work around and um, we were limited by the law. Um, Lastly, a connection that I made with the material was from another class called my constitutional history slash law. Um, unless things are specified and written out, they're subject to being found as illegitimate 
Um, that's true for the government as well as um, laws and contracts um, like the assignments of rights or inferred checks and balances. When things are not written out, they're more easily broken. Therefore, it's always to get everything written out beforehand. So thank you guys so much for watching. This was a great episode of um, Papa and Hoppa. business law class. See you guys next week.